Hello everyone and welcome to our Sunshine Coast World Oceans Day Festival and our third NEMO talk in our 2023 series. I'm Suzanne Sanger, the Executive Director of the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association. Um, our Oceans Day Festival is presented in partnership with Rhizome Up Media and the Green Film Series with support from the District of Seashell, Sunshine Coast Regional District and the Sunshine Coast Credit Union. The SCCA works to protect lands and waters on the Sunshine Coast in the territories of the Skomish, Shishal, Tliamen, Klahus, and Homolko First Nations. We are very grateful to the First Nations of this region for stewarding these lands and waters since time immemorial. We take great inspiration from the respect, reverence, and connection that Indigenous peoples have always had with nature and it is in this spirit of connection that we bring you our World Oceans Day Festival. Every year on June 8th, people all around the world come together to celebrate World Oceans Day. The United Nations designated this day to inform the global public of the impact of human actions on our oceans um, and to develop and mobilize a worldwide movement of citizens for the ocean. The theme of this year's program is Planet Ocean, Tides Are Changing. As our planet, and waters warm and seas rise, we must join forces to tackle the challenges ahead. Our festival program includes in-person and online screenings of thought-provoking and inspiring feature and short films, interactive citizen science activities, and of course, these Nemo talks, all of which are geared toward inspiring, enlisting, and connecting people to work together to take action to tackle these challenges together. Today, for our third talk, we are so excited to host Dr. Susan Anthony of uh, the Sea Change Marine Conservation Society to talk about protecting resilient estuaries on the Sunshine Coast. For the last two decades, Sea Change has worked with communities surrounding the Salish Sea to conserve, restore, and protect nearshore marine areas so vital as nurseries for salmon and all life that they depend on. Sea Change is now embarking on a four year plan to identify these estuaries and restore and conserve their unique features to increase opportunities to survive climate effects and processes. Dr. Susan Anthony brings a Bachelor of Science in Biology and minor in Ocean Sciences from the University of Victoria, a Master's in Biology at the University of Alberta, and a PhD uh, in Biology from Western University. Um, Susan joined Sea Change to lead the Resilient Estuaries of the Salish Sea Project team. The goal of the project is to identify critical estuarine habitats and rank their resiliency in the face of climate change. Susan's passion for the ocean and concern for the impacts of global climate change inspires her to learn and work with local communities to achieve the greatest outcome for Salish Sea estuaries. Susan, welcome and thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm I'm quite I'm quite I feel quite honored to be speaking to everyone today. Now, I will screen share. Shall we start off that way? Yes, please. Okay. There you go. Well, first off, um, oops, sorry. First off, I just wanted to say I'm speaking to you here in what is known as. Victoria, British Columbia. Um, it is the from it is the Gokwangan speaking people area of the Songhees and the Squamalt Nations. And I feel very um, honored to be able to speak to you today from here. Um, I also want to say, I know some people may have thought that Nikki was gonna be speaking today. Nikki Wright has been pretty much sea change with her and Sarah for 25 years. And now with it looking towards the future, we're looking at where we can expand ourselves. We've done, Sea Change itself has done so much, probably with a lot of the people here I'm speaking to, you probably know a lot more about the projects they've done than I have, but I feel really privileged to take on what they have already accomplished and develop it into the next, at least four years. Um, I will say a little bit about me. Um, I am primarily an academic with passions for the ocean. Uh, I did, here we go. You're going to play with me nicely? No? Oh, I'll just use this. Um, I just want to say I, I did a lot of my academic work at the Banfield Marine Sciences Center on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And through there, um, 
you can't help but fall in love with the oceans and see the impacts of human and climate change on these areas. Um, I'm a diver, a scientific diver. I love outreach and education, and it is absolutely fine if you refer to me as a marine weenie because that's what we were called out there. We're, we're the, the ocean nerds. And I'm hoping to bring this passion and, and my knowledge into sea change with their experience and, and, um, and great connection with community. Um, and first I'll stop, start. I mean, the, the topic of this will be ill grasses and beyond. So uh, sea change is well known for their work in conserving, restoring and protecting ill grass beds all over the Salish Sea. Eelgrass, uh, this may be a refresher for some of you, maybe new to you, but I'm sure you know all this about them. They're an incredible species. They are what is mostly uh, Zostra marina, and they are an underwater flowering plant. They can handle a wide range of salinities and, uh, and, and temperatures as well. They grow under the sediments. They need soft sediment to grow these rhizomes with roots growing down to take nutrients from the area and shoots coming up all along their rhizome bodies. They're also, they're pretty cool because not only do they reproduce sexually, you know, with the flowers, the seeds, to create new genetic diversity in their area, but also they can propagate um, vegetatively or asexually, which is bringing up almost clones. And if anyone's ever had bamboo, accidentally grow near them, they know how that can work. When it goes underground, they just shoot up anywhere you go. I just recently had to eradicate some bamboo from my place. So, um, and they're quite amazing because they are the, well, in some cases, the basis of an ecosystem of birds, migrating birds love to forage in their areas. We have um, pelagic species that live like fish. We have benthic species, which are like snails. And, and crabs and such, and then the infaunal species, bivalves and worms burying inside. So they are critical, uh, create this a critical assemblage in this ecosystem. And um, you see over here, we, sometimes we refer to eelgrass as ecosystem engineers because it's not just them living in an environment. Their presence actually alters the environment, not just the, um, not just the other species that are there, because they definitely do that, but also the, what is referred to as the abiotic environment or the non-living environment. They slow down ocean and, and river currents, allowing deposition of suspended particles. So when, when water moves really fast, it, it picks up little bits of sediment. And when it slows down, it doesn't have the energy to hold it. So it just drifts. And that allows for deposition of nutrients, nutrient sediments. Also, it slows erosion of shorelines. They provide shelter, of course. Uh, we know about them as being like a great nursery habitat. They provide oxygen, uh, food, either directly or they can be a substrate for things that become food for others. They, they grow great sort of epiphytes, which are um, organisms that grow on a plant. They're also carbon storage and with the advancement and the interest in blue carbon right now, it's another added benefit we can kind of, we can talk about. And the, this ecosystem actually extends onto the shore in some ways with the riparian vegetation or the shoreline vegetation, because it's involved with this eelgrass ecosystem because it filters pollutants and other things from the shore. It stabilizes shore to prevent runoff and fast runoff with lots of sediment can cloud the, the, the seagrasses, which can either smother them or cloud them and kind of prevent them from growing very well. Um, it also provides shade as another sort of um, like the overgrowing can actually provide shade for animals in the water, but also um, it uh, provides habitat for migrating birds and other birds that can come by and can feed in this area, they actually will find some shelter in the bushes around the shore. And the soft sediment is also super important for um, all the kind of, for rooting, for spawning, and for, for holding nutrients. So they create the ecosystem they're in, as well as the ecosystem gives them a place that they do well. And 
swimming through them, you can see all the life that actually grows on them. They may not have a, a huge variety of species, but in biomass, they're way up there, and and um, which means the amount, the volume of living things is quite high and compared to other ecosystems in, in the planet. Now, what do eelgrasses need? They're plants, so they need a lot of light energy, and, and seagrasses particularly grow in shallow waters because they need quite a, light, a lot of light, and as light penetrates into the water, you lose some of the energy, so if they need to have shallow water that isn't so turbid, so any clouding is, is not great. Um, carbon dioxide exchange, that's kind of easy to do at the uh, air sea surface interface. Also, they need a soft sediment to send out their nutrients and drop the rhizomes. They also have a nice sweet spot on uh, turbidity and uh, sorry, and, and current and flow. And we'll see how our impacts can alter their ability to survive. For instance, when we talk about near shore environment changes, the development of what is a place to um, or water from the from the shore could percolate and flow gently into the shore um, and be filtered through plants. With development, you not only have hard surfaces for water to rush off, they can either pull in nutrients, um, or sorry, I should say that they can actually not be filtered the way they should be. And also um, these docks create shading. So you create almost like a dead zone underneath uh, docks because they can't, the light, uh, sunlight can't penetrate to the seagrasses and they can't survive there. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see oh, the, the problem with anchoring and scarring. So these are um, marine boys and just with the chains that are attached to the bottom, get dragged around the surface. Uh, in a circle as tides change and create these, these scarring pockets. And also what we do on the, in the watershed on land affects seagrasses because they're often, they're close to shore and with agricultural increases, dams changing water, um, uh, water dynamics, you'll change their environment in a way that they're, let's just say, to anthropomorphize them, they, they're just not used to it. They're not, they're not uh, a bill able to really withstand these changes. Now, also not just our direct effects, but also indirect effects through climate change. Increasing temperature creates like a, what's called a thermal stress. So although seagrasses are pretty cool because they can survive in quite a large range of temperatures, even some the Arctic Zostra Marina can survive down to almost minus one degree. Um, but also up to about 30 degrees, but they don't do well. They survive, but their ability to reproduce and propagate and, and um, they're under a thermal stress, which is like a temperature stress. So they're unable to do other things like prevent disease. Um, and that, that is a, not just immediate effect, but also affect as the generations go on. Also increasing storms, we know about um, different uh, storm dynamics, more intense storms cannot just stir up uh, turbidity and create shading, but also can damage the plant itself. And then changes to precipitation. And this is huge volume of, um, of fresh water can create in changes in salinity. Seagrass, very cool, can survive in salinities that are quite fresh all the way to quite salty. But again, survival is not thriving. They can survive, but that creates a salinity stress. So we want to keep them in a, a, what's called an optimal zone. You know, we all have our own thermal optimal zone. I find this already too hot for me. And uh, I don't know if you, any of you can relate to that, but um, they can survive, but whether or not they can thrive is a whole other uh, issue. So sea change, you probably all really know about this way more than I do, is that they have done such great work over the last few decades um, doing things like uh, debris removal, things that are actually physically damaging and preventing eelgrass sustainability in areas. They also amazingly successfully have transplanted eelgrass that, you know, you take them from their rhizomes, you, uh, you give them and you relax them as it were, and you plant them in new areas. And this has been successful and really important to reclaim areas that just 
are not able to um, have a natural input from other adjoining eelgrass areas. And I mean, sometimes this, the answer can be quite straightforward, which is just asking people not to anchor in sensitive zones or to create a, a simple change with a seafloor friendly moraine or midline, midline moraine, which is to raise the chain or the line from the bottom all just to midline to float and then have the, um, the moraine boy floating on the top. So you won't have these circles as you see in the picture before. And sea change, again, long, long time uh, collaborator with many organizations around the Salish Sea with uh, eelgrass, eelgrass transplants, marine debris removal, and other kinds of restoration projects all around, including up in the Sunshine Coast where you guys are, and have, they have great relationships with all people all around. And it's what makes them so great is they are responsive to what our needs around the Salish Sea. Now here was where this project is going beyond eelgrass. And eelgrass is an essential component in many estuary environments, but estuaries don't necessarily have to have seagrass to be estuaries. However, it's the beginning of this project was what is an estuary? And after lots of research and speaking with people, and I'm happy for extra input, we have a working definition of an estuary, which is a place where fresh and salt water converge. And usually there's um, sort of an alluvial fan, you know, those fans you see at the shore and a shallow gradient, because there's a lot of sediment deposition. It's more of a vague term, but it'll help us identify many places that could use some help. This is also, if you think about it, places where seagrasses like to be. Soft sediment, shallow gradient means lots more light coming in and a place for the roots to grow. And they're able to uh, live in areas with um, low salinity, so freshwater input. Now, where are we going with the resilient estuaries of the Salish Sea project that I've just been brought into? Is first off, is we want to identify small to medium-sized estuaries in the Salish Sea. So this is not, uh, you know, Chimenez or um, or Couch and Bays. We know the issues with those places and there's a lot of great people doing work there. But we forget about the, the small to medium sized estuaries that need help, that they are actually even just like a stepping stone, a connectivity, um, helping connect all the bigger estuaries. And they're just as essential to keep that connectivity through the Sailor Sea. Then we're gonna rank them based on the resilience to impacts that are not exactly something we can control as much as we'd like to, such as the impacts of climate change, sea level rise, um, shore development, some of those things. And then based upon what these estuaries need, we'll restore and conserve them and we'll protect them in ways um, that they are needed based upon what their, the issues are and to set up some long-term monitoring to see how the impact has, how it has, how the estuaries have remained uh, resilient over time. So right now, just beginning, we're just identifying small to medium-sized estuaries of the Salish Sea. And this is where Sea Change, which has now got a uh, collaboration and has taken on a shore zone, which is a mapping and a coastal mapping organization. And I can show you now how we're using this new information and what they have provided, which is freely available information and used to help us identify um, estuaries and potentially even um, issues that they face. Now I'm going to, let's see how I can do this. I'm gonna share with you the actual website that we are using. Um, and I'll talk to you more about how people can um, access this kind of thing. Let me just move this over. Um, this right here is, um, if anyone's familiar with ArcGIS, which is um, a software program where you can start off with a base layer, which is for here, the map 
of the area where of interest. And you can, on the right-hand side, I, can you see that, the right-hand side? I just want to thumbs up. I hope so. Um, yeah, awesome. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, what we have over here are called layers. So each of these are based upon a bunch of data, but they have been this data has been put together on a map and you can actually overlay this data onto a map. In the sense that if you want to say in this area, if you wanna see where the DFO, this is publicly available information from the DFO has identified kelp beds. You can see all, this place that have, all these places that have lit up in green are areas that the DFO has identified as kelp beds from their, da from their data repository eelgrass beds as well. I think that's the same, pretty much the same color, so it's hard to see the difference. But with that, we can zoom in on particular areas to identify um, potential areas of estuary, and then we can look at it further using, using shore zone um, imagery. And let me give you an example of it. Uh, I like to first get us closer to the seashell area, which so I'll just zoom us in a little bit at a time. This original map is something that is uh, freely available. I think I was gonna, yeah, heading over to Wayfield Creek. Right here, you can see what is likely um, some kind of uh, estuary or at least an alluvial fan as I describe and that's where sediment is deposited and creates a fan shape and looking from all the data we have here I can add lines here I'll zoom out to show you how cool this looks I can add a layer showing all the the larger freshwater streams um, we can get also this freshwater information from different sources, so we can it can actually be more detailed depending on what you're interested in. Um, we also have different ways to identify some estuaries that have already been known, but these are estuaries based upon other, potentially other definitions, so we'd like to create our own. So as we zoom in, oftentimes, as we define estuaries as being a uh, convergence of fresh and salt water. So I'll look at the creek entering ocean areas and I'll get up close. And sometimes it's hard to see, is this a path people have created? Is this uh, a man-made structure for, for those things? Um, so here is where we're bringing in what is shore zone imagery. Uh, shore zone imagery, um, this red, and blue dotted line is shows the flight flight path. Shore zone goes out into helicopters with a camera and films along the coastline and then identifies different snippets of the area based upon different uh, formations. So you can ask them to pull out information uh, like where's eelgrass and they'll actually, oh, in this picture, this picture, this picture will have it. So it's an incredible resource, all freely available. And one thing you can do is click on this area. And I uh, just wanted to check And here, you have a photo of that area. So I can zoom in and tell for sure, oh yeah, there's a big freshwater input into the ocean. That's great. Sometimes the photos aren't available and they're not so clear. So here's where you can grab the video, the actual original video that they filmed from the camera. Sometimes you'll tell it's a helicopter, you'll see the shadow of the helicopter in the video. And here is where they take the information. And from this, this visualization, they can identify that there's actually people there looking at all of these footages and outlining areas of eelgrass, of, um, of kelp, and different uh, potentially like physical things like, uh, like rocks versus cobble versus silt. And it's a really great resource, resource that we can use to remotely identify areas that we can look at in, in proximity. Now, I will go back to presentation. Here we are. Um, and I wasn't sure if I could show you the video, so I will now scroll past all the uh, 
screenshots I took. But um, here, actually, this is an outline I did of different areas within the Sailor Sea that we would like to explore for, um, for estuaries and estuaries that could use some assistance. We have, for the next four years, expanding our scope as we go. And that's why uh, I'm here to talk to you because this is where we wanna work with people to identify these areas that are of concern, that are critical, and what kind of concerns are there. Um, here's where I show my little, uh, Little snippets in case the the connectivity to the uh, website didn't work. Our next step in all of this is to rank them by resilience. Now, here's a huge question: is what is resilience? And that, me personally, I go to the primary literature. I say, what have people considered resilience in the past? And that's led to uh, over uh, one and a half million links to primary research. I've compiled the most essential ones and been, have been reading them for information and some of them are quite great because they tell you all about what people have thought of as resilience and the research that has shown leading to kind of a complicated mind map of mine of how what is resilience and how can we measure it and this is where also it's important to work along with everybody and all of us to be putting our knowledge together because I can only read what some people have said, but when people are there, they can see resilience. They've seen it over like decades, over over millennia. They've seen resilience. They also see how things are being damaged, and we can work together to find these um, estuaries, to identify them, to rank them, and to know more about them from people who live them, from people who have the resources to uh, restore if we can. And then, yeah, create a consensus on how to approach this into the future. Now, that's why I'm so happy and thrilled to be speaking with you guys today, because this is my first uh, chance to talk to outside groups and say, let's connect and let's talk about this. I want input and I want us to work things on things together from the very ground going. I can only read papers and that's that's only a fraction of, of the ways in which we can approach such a big and a, important problem that we have right now. And for here, I wanna say thank you so much for uh, having me speak today. I'm absolutely open to be hearing from any of you, any of you even just, hey, there's an estuary down the street for me. And it, 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 I think you should look at it. I think we should do something about it. E email me, Susan at seachangesociety.com. I'm also sort of on Twitter and sort of on LinkedIn, but I'm pretty good at email. And I just want to thank you so much for your time today and listening to where we're looking to go. That's, that's really wonderful, Susan. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'm totally inspired by those maps and all the great work you're doing and bringing into this. Um, it's just, it's fantastic to learn about the eelgrass and estuaries on the coast and how we can measure resilience in the nearshore environment. I got to say something that really hit hit home for me in your presentation is that small to medium sized estuaries are stepping stones for ecosystem and wildlife connectivity. Um, mm. This is such a familiar concept in the terrestrial conservation conversation, <laughs> uh, but mm -hmm. it's not something I really considered in this way until like just now when you were describing that. So that's a huge takeaway for me. Um, we're gonna move into a Q and A part of the conversation. Maybe can you stop screen sharing? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm gonna be um, inviting everybody to um, ask questions of Susan. We're gonna do that in two ways. Uh, you can either use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you to ask your question directly, or you can, if you don't want to do that, you can post a question in the chat and I will ask it for you. Um, because it's hard for me to see everybody, well, it's not that hard, actually. You can raise your hand by, you know, turning your video on if you want to, or by using the reactions button at the bottom of Zoom and and clicking that and then the little raise hand function will pop up and you can do that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just 
give folks a second if anybody wants us to ask a question wants to ask a question before I start bombarding you with my own. <laughs> I think uh, there's one already in chat. Ah, there we go. And All I right. believe it's the exact question you asked before I gave the talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, Doug Martinson says, any chance of getting a copy of the slides? Oh, the slides. Absolutely. Yes. Sorry. Absolutely. And uh, it's also, this is being recorded. So part of the recording you can find online through you or through YouTube and it will go through it all. You can pause and rewind. So. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, maybe we will go back to that question originally. I think it was Ian who was asking when we were first setting up in the conversation, Susan, about how do we how do we get those maps? How do we access them? Or how do we get the, can we use it? Who's using it? Well, that's absolutely a great question. It's, it's partly, um, Everybody is a, it's all the information that is put together to create these maps that we were I was showing you about uh, is all information that's freely available. Now the um, a lot of it comes primarily from Shorezone. Their website's a little right now, so we're working on that because Shorezone has been brought in to see change, and we're doing a big you know someone's going to fix our website and put them all together. And so that information is freely available. You can look at all the videos. You can look at all the photos along the coast. They do not just the Salish Sea. They've done Alaska. They had to cancel their recent trip to Bay of Fundy because of the the, the pilot they had was involved in firefighting. Uh, so this is not this is a Canada and into the U.S. Uh, endeavor, and it's been going on for a while. Um, GFO has a lot of the information. We found information from NOAA, from all kinds of other sources, and it's provided in a format that this is where we have a guru, which is Shawnee. Um, Shawnee Malcolm, who works for Shorezone, is now working on this project. She can put it together in this um, the software called ArcGIS. Now, the maps are showing you that it was a website that was our working um, it's almost like you know you have your own document you work on the yeah. information is coming from other sources but we're putting it in a way that works for what we're doing i would love to have um i'm going to talk to johnny because after speaking to you the interest is there to have something out there that people who are interested in can just look at what shore zone has in a way that's accessible you don't have to know gis to begin with however gis is a Incredible software, but I think it's a licensing issue. But if nothing else, I will provide um, photographs or like screenshots of some of the stuff that's there. And please contact me and I can answer further to that. So anyone's interested, please email. Yeah, that's amazing. I find one of the things that I bump up against in the conservation work is that it's it's hard to know where all the data lives in all the different places so when i see something yeah. like this i'm like yes you're curating all this data you're communicating it in a way that is that is accessible and and makes sense and, and yeah. access and that's i mean honestly it's it's a huge issue for the conservation community because you're it, like having boots on the ground i mean we we mm -hmm. work with diane sanford and the friends of forage fish society and other groups around you know doing like doing the eelgrass mapping and the forage fish sampling and that kind of stuff and getting those data but we you know it's a small it's a it's a drop in the big ocean of information <laughs> literally that we yeah. have to that we have to access so yeah it's really neat um, and as as we find new sources we've been kind of compiling it so like i said our primary sources are from shore zone and from dfo but there's and noaa but also PSF, the Pacific Salmon Foundation has amazing uh, information they brought to us, or they have that is freely available. And there's another source, and I forget what it is, it's a remote sensing satellite system where um, it, its resolution isn't so great. So you can't get fine scale like to each estuary, but you can get a general sense of current flow um, through the year even. And also like where salinity ends up. So it actually maps chlorophyll, which is to identify plankton blooms. And it, you can see how it moves. And it's all, again, freely available information. And that website, I can, I can send a link to once I find that. 
um, I can link that and send it off to Suzanne to share. And you can look at it yourself and visualize the Salish Sea and all the different components that make up it. Because the sea is just so, not only changes, like it changes daily, it changes monthly, it changes yearly. And there's so many layers to it. Pardon me for using that term again, but you've got salinity, which is, you know, how much salt is in the water. Then you have how much plankton bloom, you have currents, you have temperature, you have all these different factors that come together. And when you overlay them, you can find intersections of areas that are, are fanta a fantastic way to identify and just say, hey, maybe this is a place we should look at. It's connected to, um, it has a connection, it has like a, a current stepping stone, as we talked about, between bigger estuaries. And we were talking about the connectivity of another essential part about it is, um, and stepping stone is not just a static as eelgrass is a static thing that fish can go as a stepping stone as they go towards the ocean, but also I'm thinking salmon, of course, <laughs> but also it itself is a living organism. So when you have close eelgrass beds close to each other, if something disturbance can happen to one, it can be colonized by the local nearby eelgrass. So a natural form of our replanting process. So knowing that this estuary may not be so important, but because it's next to one that's really important, you've got to preserve it too, because it's like the backup. Yeah, that's such a good point. I, so I guess one of the things, our mandate is to, you know, protect lands and waters. And so this is, these are amazing tools to then be used to help facilitate those conversations around what needs to be protected and how to protect things. And so mm -hmm. we've been having the last couple of days conversations around, you know, how can we use this information and this research and this data to advance those kinds of conversations? And do you, do you have a, a program or around that well this is the beginning of a program of being able to use all of this into at least for sea change it's kind of new because in the past i i wouldn't say it was reactive but it was more we there they had this uh, ability to conserve and protect and they have these abilities to the barge to remove big debris all this kind of stuff that they have ability to do but now we're going into with the shore zone information and hopefully with me coming in is have this way to help identify. I don't want to use the term triage, but it, it means like maybe we can look at other places and say, hey, we know this one's damaged, but this one we should put some more effort into. Um, but from where we're standing, from our shore zone and from my research, that's like I said, it's only a small part of it. This is where it needs to be a huge group effort. This, and, and that's why I'm here to reach out for any in, input, uh, anything you wanna hear from me. We're all here, we're all doing it. We all have the same goal, we're all in it together. Yeah, that's awesome. I really appreciate that. One of the, we focused a lot locally on um, something that we're, you know, we're participating in the SCCA has got a campaign where we're working with local governments and uh, some other NGOs to try to advance uh, really to strengthen local government environmental protection tools. So like foreshore mm -hmm. development permit areas and this kind of thing. So that's one of the one of the things we've been focusing on. Um, we had the District of Seashell has a really good DPA for foreshore protection. Um, and but right. it's challenging, right? Like it's, mm. it's a challenging piece to communicate to waterfront development or waterfront property owners what to do, what not to do, and the links between, you know, how they treat the land and what the impacts on the on the marine ecosystems are going to be. So, yeah, and then also the there's like a disconnect between the local governments, right? So we're trying to actually bridge mm -hmm. that and have that conversation, bring all the local governments together to have that conversation to like have a streamlined set of development permit areas that look at the yeah. impacts on the land and how that flows into the ocean. So we well, would love to talk more about how we can, you know, use the information that you're coming up with and 
to facilitate that conversation too. We'll rope you into that campaign. I, I'm here for you. I'm here yes. for you. I'm very oh, happy. That's great. I have, I have one agenda and that's conserve these areas. That's my agenda, conserve the coast, the conserve the ocean. So. Excellent. Well, I'm not seeing other people jump in. So I'm going to actually going to take this into a different direction because they're like so something i've been thinking about a lot recently um is the McNabb estuary in how sound mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. you know there's this big long battle really to um try to to uh, stop the proposed development of the burnco gravel pit and mm -hmm. that was i can't remember all the numbers now but it was just this huge it would have had a huge impact on this really important estuary in the sound and uh, it received all its permitting and you know that was five years ago and we thought oh no this is really going to happen but the local government again stepped in and and rejected an application by the um the company to process gravel on the site which landed up making the pro project um financially unviable, I guess. And so just a couple months ago, their permit expired. And, you know, now we have this like moment of truth where, you know, here we are looking at McNabb and the mm -hmm. potential for, you know, a huge um, um, good news story about restoration yeah. and, um, and habitat protection. So I wonder. Well, and as I say, uh, uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> and prevention is yes, pr preventing these things from happening uh, versus having to restore afterwards. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 I'm just reading Edith. Um, Edith from the Squamish River Watershed Society just popped uh, some comments in the chat. And feel free to jump in here, Edith. Um, she says, for years we've been monitoring McNabb for eelgrass, and it just wasn't. Ah, it just wasn't found to be suitable habitat. Maybe that's changed in recent years, but from her experience, it was a good site. Wasn't a good site for eelgrass restoration efforts. However, excellent opportunities for Chinook salmon habitat improvements. Oh. Edith doesn't have a mic or video, so feel free to keep popping your That's comments in the chat. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm keeping you open so I can read them. Um, <laughs> I'm, un <laughs> um, I'm unfamiliar with that area, but what I know about it, uh, what's kind of cool with what our project is, it's not necessarily, we're interested not necessarily in eelgrass or salmon specifically, it's an estuary in habitat because even without a maybe there's some reason um the suitability is not there i mean i talked about just too, turbidity it may be the runoff it's just too high there's too much current because we see a lot of that which is um the current may be too strong all kinds of reasons for this but being just for um i'll, I'll answer alan's question after just uh salmon and eelgrass are not the be all and end all although they're essential and super important and sometimes the basis of a lot of funding uh there's other animals that and other biosystems that are essential and also like i said even connectivity even just providing a biotic means to transfer um from one site to another uh one thing we talk about in the in the in the research of ecology is gene flow and this is something that a lot of people don't talk about, but it is a problem with a lot of um, a lot of projects where you bring in species or individuals from other places, you reduce the amount of genetic diversity. And genetic diversity is important because some some species, some individuals, I should say, some individuals of a species are more able to sustain certain disturbances um and some are less able because that they have what's called a local adaptation and what we want is to have as much genetic diversity not just species biodiversity but genetic diversity so that when things come happen at least some of the population can withstand it if not all of it if not all the population so that's why you want 
a mixing of gene flow. And that can be, um, which actually ties into Alan's question, which is how are eelgrass seeds distributed? One thing is a lot of eelgrass seeds are uh, negatively buoyant, so they fall. Uh, however, there's been some research that it actually, some seeds raft attached to other floating um, sort of detritus and can float on currents to different areas. So even by disrupting that, um, I guess, highway, you can disrupt gene flow between two different areas. And then one area that could be a, a, a place that gets reseeded from somewhere else has lost that connectivity. So even without an eel grass bed there, there's, there could still be a disruption of connectivity. Wow, that's intriguing. Um, Leanne, Leanne posted a comment. There was an old log sort in part of the area. So I guess maybe there's a question. Yeah, how, yeah log sorts are huge, right? Now that's the problem because that is something that can be um, a problem for many years after the disturbance because this kind of increase, um, a lot of the logs around here have compounds that are just not naturally found in that high a level. And the bits, just bark bits falling down and landing in areas can almost contaminate the soil. Although it's, it's uh, a natural product, as we all know, natural does not mean good necessarily. So in the same way that uh, cedar repels insects in your, you know, moths in your, uh, in your uh, cabinets, sometimes cedar has these oils that can prevent the soil being uh, the right, right, particles and 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 uh, nutrients at the right amounts for eelgrass to grow and this is actually where um the most important piece of the puzzle right now is not uh colonial or settler history and this is where long-standing indigenous knowledge is a great huge piece of the puzzle because it can tell us not it, uh, not just what we know in like western like settler recorded history, but what it has been and what it therefore could be. Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's interesting even, I, I don't have, a, I, I guess I don't have a lot of experience with um, receiving or learning or hearing First Nations traditional knowledge and the history, but I have lots of um, old timer uh, folks who <laughs> your long timer just like elders who yeah. you know yeah. talk about how uh, you know how things used to be in the environment mm -hmm. you know you could walk across the creeks on the fish and the um, and the sea grasses were just you know thick yeah. and full and teeming with life and how yeah. you know um, and that is kind of a foreign concept to folks who are either new to the area or new to the shorelines or mm -hmm. younger because that's not our experience at all. And so it, it's, I, I find that piece of it, I'm really glad you brought that up is it's really hopeful as well because it's not something that sometimes we just sort of naturally can imagine ourselves what it might be like. So that I guess is um, with your, uh, community engagement? Will there be opportunities for uh, groups like ours to hear from First Nations about some of that? Well, that's, uh, I mean, Sea Change has had such a great relationship with uh, the First Nations groups along this peninsula, especially. Um, and we want to carry on that amazing uh, connection and friendship and working relationship as well. I mean, a lot of sea change started working uh, with Sartlip and uh, into Todd Inlets, or uh, I'm trying to remember the pronunciation, Snakeum Inlet. I'm, uh, that's probably wrong. Um, Sneasels, I, I can spell it. I can't pronounce it. I'm very sorry. Uh, but that is almost where it started. And because that area, which was, uh, if anyone is not familiar with Todd Inlet as I was not, it was a wintering habitat for um, like a wintering village, I guess I should say, in the inlet, in a Saanich Inlet, because it's nice and sheltered. And there's a plentiful food such as um, shellfish mostly. 
So there's a lot of the midden piles that have been there to show what it was and the stories from people of their parents, their grandparents having been in that place. But it was about a hundred years ago that a quarry started up there, then a cement factory and all this. So what we know of that area is it's being quite barren, but historically is an important historical, cultural and ecological site. So you, there's no, there's no splitting apart these, these stories because um, what we know in our sort of settler knowledge is just like the little bit at the end. Yeah. And whereas ecosystems have either survived or, or dynamically changed with the changing world for, for millennia, they, that's what we have to really be thinking about. Shifting baselines, yes, very yeah. much so. Yeah, and hopefully with all the good work that everybody's doing on, you know, the research and monitoring and restoration, then hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, we can be shifting the baselines back. I mean, that's the whole, the whole point of point of all. And, of and, <laughs> and I will say that's actually a, I didn't want to get into too much, but the definition of resiliency is a whole other kettle of fish because is it something that resists change is it something that changes with the changing environment is it something that um can be damaged but repaired quickly there's very many different ways of looking at it should we restore things to the way they were or should we um restore them to something that can withstand the global change that we just unfortunately are not able to stop at the freight train at least at this level yeah, you're you're one of the little notes that I had to ask about was um, thermal impacts, and I mm -hmm. guess or thermal stress, and that's sort of one of those things. Like we can change some things, we can help with bits and pieces, but heat <laughs> and the warming of the ocean isn't really. I mean, yeah. So that's that's a huge. Um, it's a huge concept or conversation around what does resilience look like as things that are way bigger than we can actually manage. And uh, I, I will say that that's, I mean, it sounds kind of weird that my PhD was in thermal physiology. So it's like biochemistry and physiology. But what, what interested me is the impact of heat on all processes of an organism, which then can translate to process of an ecosystem. And the whole, whole idea like I was five, but can you thrive? Can you sustain at those levels? And yes, uh, thank you for Alan again, uh, Colleen Wade Davis, ecological amnesia. Yeah. Sometimes it's just within our own lifetime or even just if we've only lived in a place a short term, that's all we know and that's all that we seem to be interested in. Yeah. Um, I, um... Well, I'm looking at the time we're getting close to the end and I wondered if okay. there's anything else Susan that you wanted to sort of share or touch on before we before we wind up. Well, I'm um, just that I'm I'm really happy to be here and I'm I'm thrilled to hear from anyone who wants to reach out to me because this is not something that I I'm going to jump in and be like, all right, well, I've got, you know, this paper says this. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that's just, that's one way to kind of look at it, it's good to have some of that information in your pocket. But I learned way more by talking to someone who's like, well, I noticed this. It's like, well, I've never read about that. Oh, yeah, because no one's, you didn't write about it. It's the information's out there. And sometimes just talking to people, you learn way more than you could ever measure. Awesome. Yeah. And we have such a, I mean, on the Sunshine Coast, there's so many people who are just really active in the, like at all the levels of the conservation conversation, where they're just, you know, going to the beach every day and looking at what they yeah. see and making a note of it. And we have all these Facebook groups where people are posting about what they've, you know, what they see and what they're experiencing. And so I'm sure that when we share your information, oh, there's Leanne, when, yes. uh, you know, you're gonna get people um, really <laughs> contacting yes. you. Go ahead, Leanne. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, to point out to me, it is the, the stories 
Thank you, Susan, for talking about the importance of story and local knowledge and local experiences and observations, because to me, it is the individual, like my specific interaction with, like wading in, like poking around and looking at the stuff in an estuary and seeing from one year to the next how it changed and where the water went, <laughs> where it's going now, where it was last year. And yeah. watching those dynamics that provide me, and I think a lot of other people too, a personal connection and a personal importance of working on doing everything we can <laughs> to keep ourselves however it's defined, as resilient as we possibly can. And, and certainly as diverse. I, I know I just felt like that summer that we had that heat dome that killed all the barnacles and the stench. And I would just go down to the beach and cry because it was so sad. And now I go down to the beach every year, like this week at low tide, and cheer the baby barnacles, grow, grow, grow. <laughs> and the, you know, the little muscles that are coming along. And so I think, although that is that is scientifically dangerous as anthropomorphizing something that it's really a natural phenomenon, nonetheless, we're we're part of that we're not a part from it separate from it but we are a part of and uh so i think it is important that we can maintain those kinds of relationships as well as uh this wonderful uh information that's that's getting gathered and i keep thinking holy cow <laughs> this is fantastic thank you so much susan for for sharing all of that with us yeah thank you so much for your input on that and it's it is true i mean i anthropomorphize everything <laughs> uh that's just the natural way to do it you're connected to it and you it's got to think like you do uh, but um it, it, it is we're we're part of it and we gotta the stories are i know what you mean by some scientists think they're dangerous but that's that's not for uh we're not trying to convince <laughs> scientists we're trying to save the ocean <laughs> that's right absolutely <laughs> absolutely oh i'm muted again here we go um <laughs> uh on that note I, uh, I think we're going to wind up the event and I'm just going to say huge thanks again, Susan, for, for, you know, leading this project, for taking it on. It's lovely to have you at Sea Change and um, I'm sure uh, you're just so fortunate to, you know, have Nikki and, um, and her team there supporting you and it's great to have your new face and your new energy too, so that's really wonderful. Um, to everybody who joined us, thank you so much for being part of our Nemo Talk series. We, um, we hope you enjoyed this one today and um, the events from the last couple of days, they have been posted up on YouTube. So if you want to have a look, feel free and we we'll hope you'll join us um, over the next couple of days for the rest of our festival uh, activities. Tomorrow's Nemo Talk. Um, lunchtime again, 12 to 1 p.m. is Heather Earle, and she'll be talking about tracking Dungeness crab across the Salish Sea, uh, community science for crabs. Yes, we're going to see you tomorrow, Susan, I'm, I'm sure of it. Um, and because tomorrow's World Oceans Day, we've got a, a few things actually happening. Diane Sanford's doing uh, forage fish sampling in Seashelt from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, at the Trail Bay Wharf, Friendship Park. And then in the evening, we're having uh, like a celebration. Um, so 7.30 at the Roberts Creek Hall, um, there will be food and refreshments. And uh, we're showing a short film called Uncharted Waters about some of the amazing marine conservation work that's happening in Howe Sound. We've got uh, folks who will be presenting on the biosphere and from Marine Life Sanctuary Society and 
on the film. I'm probably forgetting something I usually do, um, but it's going to be really fun. And it's, you know, tomorrow we, we really want to celebrate and we want to, you know, have some fun and engage people and come together to, you know, look at, at some of the good work that's happening because sometimes it's hard to do that when we see the state of the oceans and stuff. So we really encourage people to come out and join us and have fun. Um, and just as a last bit, I always really like to thank our sponsors again, the District of Seashell, at CRD and Sunshine Coast Credit Union for giving us money to put these, these talks on in the festival and to our amazing working group, um, particularly Diane Sanford and Angela Kronig and Billy Carroll, Rhizome Up Media and the Green Film Series. And I do also wanna do a shout out to the Gibson's Marine Education Center, as I, I forgot to do that before, but this year uh, the folks in Gibson's jumped on board with our festival and they are actually hosting events and they hosted a film and all kinds of stuff too. So it's, um, you know, it's, it is this sort of changing tide theme is, you know, as climate changes, we have to too. And that means we have to come together and work together uh, to do the good work. And I really do see that happening, especially with this project, Susan, and with and with our festival too. So it's, it's, it's really great to see, it's heartwarming. So thanks again to everybody for attending and for all your good work. And we hope to see you at the next events too. Thanks, thanks everyone for inviting me.